What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Andrew just said this is probably the best interview we've had yet. Listen, I don't always fanboy, but <laughs> Justin Whitmull Early is one of my favorite authors. He wrote a book called Habits of the Household, which has drastically changed my perspective of parenting mm -hmm. and the day-to-day -day that is involved with parenting. And he recently came out with a book called Made for People, which is about friendships which is an interesting topic when you're an adult and you have kids and less time to make friends. So him and his wife, Lauren, sit down with us. We talk through habits of the household, how it got started, why they started changing the habits in their life, especially when it, as it pertains to kids. They then talk about Made for People, the other book about how to make friends as adults, the importance of it, why our world is so lonely. And yeah. They're great people. They're they, very wise. This is actually his third book. His first one was The Common Rule. And also Lauren has her own list that she has online called Lauren's List where she's thoughtfully collected different batches, whether it be picture books or mm -hmm. kids books or, or materials for adults. Anyway, what strikes me and is so impressive to me about these two is just their thoughtfulness and ability to provide vocabulary and like a grid of navigating life. So whether it be parenting and habits of the household, they break down each day into 10 different phases and give you very tangible, practical, yeah. at the end of each chapter, things to try, things to say. And it's like so helpful when you want to be a good parent or you want to be a better spouse, but you don't know how to. Like, where do you start? This is a great starting point. Yeah, it's overwhelming to think I need to change my life or I need to be a better parent or I need to raise good kids. They, he somehow beautifully writes both of these books in a way you're like, oh, I can do that today. Yeah. And that tomorrow. And it adds up to the end result that you want. Anyways, if you don't have his books yet, we will link them all down below. Get them all. Um, most importantly for him, get made for people. It's his new one. It's out. But I would highly recommend you get them all. Yeah, and he did the same practical takeaways with Made for People about even having a phone conversation written out of what you could say. And it's really, really important material. Um, so thank you, Justin and Lauren, for joining us. Some of my favorite topics we discussed were uh, when we were discussing hospitality, when we were discussing what it looks like to have friends in a season of having a newborn as well mm -hmm. um, and navigating all these different things. So. I'm excited to bring you this conversation. I, I thought it was one of the most philosophically riveting for me. And also just, uh, it was a treat to meet one of my favorite authors as well. So without further ado, we bring you Justin Whitmore Early and his wife, Lauren. I'm so excited for this, honestly. I don't know. I don't often fanboy, but like, I would say you're one of my favorite authors. And like the Dude. fact that, I'm not kidding. Oh, this is great. So yeah. Yeah. I just, <laughs> so Being so uh, I'm, he also reads a lot of books. So. Well, I think it's cool because I, I somehow, along the lines of Lauren's making fun of me, not paying enough attention to things going on out there. You, I think you had messaged me months ago. Yeah, first time I read the book. Right, and I somehow like missed it, unfortunately. <laughs> and I was like following you guys. Like, These guys are so cool, man. I'd love to figure out if I could talk to them about the book. And then you realize. And then somebody was like, hey, they mentioned your book on their podcast. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. And then I started fanboying. And we just, you know, we were like, in the high school dating, like <laughs> yeah. missing each other. Both of our small, like small groups, have read your books. Oh, that's so cool. They've been the center of discussion for quite a while. Yeah, I feel yeah. like really, yeah. But I'm embarrassed. So, I mean, it's been a pretty sloppy first meeting on my part. <laughs> Sean, did Justin tell you about the workout yesterday? <laughs> yeah, I, he was. He was. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he, he, I was he appreciated just, it. But. I really liked it. I just, I was glad that I didn't throw up. <laughs> I made a wise decision. I was like, I'm going <laughs> to humble myself before the Lord and, and do 95 on this because I know. Uh, but you did not humble yourself. You did 115, and that's a he lot. Didn't, he didn't, which is not smart for that many reps. And he used a 30-pound wall ball. I took a I took a picture of the amount yeah. that I sweat, and it was appalling. But yeah. like usually it's like a couple bros. We work out. It's like a nice camaraderie moment. I was close to passing out and then he wanted to get in the sauna afterwards <laughs> You're like, i was not anyway and then i spilled coffee on my shirt and then we're like you know making him no, wait for an the, interview the preface to that story is when we started dating we started working out together very quickly learned we can never work out together but then wait he, it just uh, we don't work out well together okay i correct him too much <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> he is terrible for him. And so like, I it's correct like us writing together. Yes, yeah. yeah. oh. that's like me trying to write. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> it was the start of a lot of marital fights. Our first two a lot, years. <laughs> like a lot. He said he said you were his most sav- <laughs> savage editor. I still am. I'm so good. <laughs> All caps. <laughs> <savage. laughs> Consuming. But then he would still ask me to program for him, and I'd program, and then he would still get mad, and then. Probably a couple of years into marriage, you just kind of were like, I'm, I don't need it anymore. And yesterday he was like, will you program? I was like, wow. It was a good bonding sure? moment for all of us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we bonded in some vulnerability. I felt like it was <laughs> yeah, too hard. Yeah. <laughs> but I am still, I'm like wondering what's in your head because I don't, like a games athlete might be able to do all that in an hour. <laughs> I'm like, who do you think? Uh, we are. <laughs> it was really hard. Yeah. Right. Do you do CrossFit too? No, sadly. Okay. I wish. Maybe still, someday. Yeah, I'm still recovering from a lot of injuries. You're an athlete. You did a couple sports? I told like you you did school. basketball and yeah. soccer. Yeah, I would love to like really get in there with my boys and coach soccer. But That would be awesome. I tore my Achilles in the fall. So I'm <gasps> oh, still no. recovering from that. Last fall? In October. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the four, our four boys came in like a eight years. Yeah, stretch. I have postpartum so injuries still. A lot of pelvic floor like, stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then she tore her Achilles last Love fall. Wait for it. Yeah. <laughs> Dancing at a church retreat. Yeah. She tore a Achilles. Okay. Too. Wow. She's a really good Wait. dancer. <laughs> what type of, we were doing like the you Jackson know, the, 5 the Roomba right? or what? Well, it was a dance off. <laughs> oh okay, my God. That. It was a big group game. And our, our, <laughs> like with our kids, we were trying to win. And That's I awesome. just stepped back. We're pretty sure I stepped on my son with all my weight <laughs> on my heel <laughs> of one foot. Oops. So kind of like, because like he fell down, I fell down. Later, we were like, he's six. We we're like, didn't I step on you? He no. was fine. Lauren didn't walk for no, terrified. Three and then like a month later, he was like, you did step I was on like, me. Snapping your Achilles is rough. And it's like a it's minimum really of bad. a year. Yeah, I'm not like at a year rate. yet. Yeah. So, like but two I, months ago, I could like do like everything I needed to do. But I still like I can't run yet. Yeah. I can't. Dang. I can't like lift myself up on my left leg. Yeah. That kind of thing. So Dang. I'm still like doing a million like calf raises. Yeah. Well, you're eight months out, nine months out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot better, but it's still it's like, a lot better. Am I going to be able like my legs are noticeably different size is still oh that'll that's come the, back don't okay. worry <laughs> i've done full knee reconstructions multiple times okay well that's that's good you'll come back this is my most significant injury and it was like i was just starting to be athletic again <laughs> yeah that is the worst feeling though the the setback of it yeah, yeah. It's humbling how'd you guys meet in, all right in college playing ultimate frisbee i noticed her across the field she's like she's cute and she can catch <laughs> and i was like i don't think i got i don't think we met or got your name then but then later at like a cookout that night, I started talking to her, only to find out she was dating one of my high school friends. Oh. And I was like, mm. But then I think a month later, I heard that you guys were sort of on the rocks. Mm. And I called him and I was like, Can I take her out? Oh, that's huge. This guy's a gentleman, dude. I was going to say, That is huge. <laughs> yeah. I would not have done that. We were on the same <laughs> campus yeah. ministry. I mean, <laughs> so. Okay, it was a small world. It wasn't yeah. a high school <laughs> acquaintance, it was like a. a Fairly close high school. We weren't super close, but it was enough to be. He like, married one of my college roommates, so and they yeah. go to church with us now. So it's wow. fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> dang. And so I asked if she would come to see my band play. <laughs> I was in a screamo band, uh, like a punk rock, emo <laughs> hardcore what? band. It was awesome. <laughs> and she came. I can't didn't really fit in. Yeah. But that was that was the beginning of it all. Mm-hmm. I cannot picture you in a screamo band. I'm trying to figure out. If he was I've a drummer, a, but I've he was a, a screamer. Oh my god! A lot of versions of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys are familiar with the Enneagram, everyone is surprised that Justin's a four. And they're like, "Well, you didn't know him in college." <laughs> yeah, a four is a is like wants the individualist, the, like the okay. unique, like Interesting. sometimes like the romantic or the artist types. So. Which I get as an author, mm-hmm. yeah. writer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's coming around. But like when he became a business lawyer, people are like, "What? How is what that possible?" Um, I'm a one. Uh, which is like the perfectionist, mm-hmm. <laughs> which makes sense. Yeah. She likes things to, to be the... done right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> correctly. So Same. if the yeah. sentence is not correct, yeah, or probably if the I care more about correct. it being done than I. Justin has really helped rough soften that edge for me. Now yeah. I know you have to like romance someone into correction, mm-hmm. and, like woo them versus like he's like if you smile, everything's different. And you critique someone. I'm like, wow, like, so why did it take thing? me 10 years to learn that life lesson? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can take notes of that. We marriage. can take notes of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Okay. I want to talk. Uh, well, actually, no, no. I, I need to learn more about this relationship because I want, given 
all the facts that we've shared so far, I, I bet the engagement was epic. Or is that <laughs> a little bit? It yeah. was. Well, the cool thing about our engagement was, so he was a year ahead of me in college. So he graduated. And part of our early early um, 20s story is we lived in China. And so he went ahead and did an intern year as a missionary in China my senior year of college. So we were dating long distance. like, And those were in the days of like Skype like breaking up. Yes. Yeah, he's in China, 12 hours ahead. Um, it's an intern year, so the only reason you get to come home to the States, because it's only a nine-month thing, is if one of your immediate family members has a wedding or funeral. And uh-huh. so his sister, his older sister, Rachel, gets married. And so he gets to come home for five days. And he knows I like surprises. <laughs> and so, like, you know, it's like he gets there. The wedding's, like, three days after. He's in the wedding. There's one day. And so we have, like, this epic day date and then surprise proposal at the end. Yeah. And then you and then he flies out the next morning. And then I fly out the next morning to go back to China for six months. (laughs) Yeah. We didn't see each other for the next Yeah. That Yeah. It's amazing and brutal at the same time. (laughs) I actually thought doing engagement separate was a nice way to do it Mm. because you couldn't pretend that you were married. Yeah. It was just like we came home and got married. It was four months and then we got married like six weeks after he got home. Wow. Oh my gosh. So I planned the wedding like my last semester of college and I have said that before. I Engagement is not fun. No. And it's no. not easy. Because you're more than dating, less than married, which is <sighs> awful. Doesn't make any mm-hmm. sense. No, yeah. it's such a no man's land. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is why it was kind of nice to be separate. But for me, I, I, this story on my end was it was really spiritually helpful for me because in college when we were dating, I was just like falling hard in love with Lauren. But I had this hang up of like, the more I get to know her, the more I was, oh, she's still a flawed person. She's mm-hmm. not perfect. And I had this idea of a, a wife in my head that would like always make me happy, oh, like have no, <laughs> never have any problems. And so I actually broke up with her once because I was like, it's not perfect. There must be something wrong. She's not a soulmate. And and then I realized, oh, this is horrible. But she wouldn't talk to me because we were broken up. She's like, if we're broken up, I'm not talking to you at all. So then we got together. <laughs> I told and, him, this is the wrong decision. And if you do this, I'm not going to be friends with you. She literally was when he broke up with in you, the conversation we we're bringing up. <laughs> you know, One of my clearest terrible. like moments of inspiration, I think, from the Holy Spirit. Oh my <laughs> yeah. god! No, literally, we're talking like it was true. outside and I just our said it. college house, and like I'm talking about like how we need to break up, and I was like, it was I didn't know like the conversation was not going well, and then it was finally like this good night. She goes, "I love you." It was the first time she'd ever said it. After you broke up with her? At the moment I was breaking up with her. Because <laughs> I was like, this is the wrong decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I walked away. <laughs> I was just like, at the point of the story is I had a lot of stuff to figure out internally. They, yeah. There's no question I loved her and wanted to marry her in retrospect. But I, I had to get comfortable with the idea that like marriage wasn't supposed to just always make me happy. It was supposed to make me holy. And it like the hard parts were there for a reason. And so it was in China when I was like reading Ephesians one morning about how God you know, we're, the, we're the, the bride of the church and he washes us with the word. It's this idea of like, oh, marriage is supposed to have trouble and washing and, you know, you fix things and you work on it. And that's when I was like, oh, all right, if I'm going to have trouble with anybody I date or marry, I, I want it to be Lauren. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. She's my favorite trouble. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then I was like, I'm proposing. And it was like within a month, I was like, I'm going to go home for my sister's wedding. I'm going to propose. And from that moment on, like I never... I don't know, 16 years now, right? Mm, almost. Best yeah. decision I ever made. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Share more about that. It's not supposed to make you happy. Marriage is supposed to make you holy. Mm. I mean, this will get into some of the the parenting stuff. Yeah, too. I was going to say, I think becoming a parent is the, the mm-hmm. similar process. Mm. I think <laughs> yeah. one of the things that I've learned ever, probably ever since college, was that life is not actually easy. Like a lot of things are hard. There's a lot of suffering that will happen. And the best things in life will ask probably the most of you, like marriage and children. Mm. And whether it's like the physicality of it, like, you know, you Mm -hmm. get pregnant and Mm -hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, my body hurts. This is hard. I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. Um, Children Mm -hmm. wake up whenever they want in the night. (laughs) They don't, they don't ask permission. (laughs) They Mm -hmm. fight. We fight. There's all this stuff where I'm like, oh, this is hard. And I think I just always had this idea that, you know, the marriage and kids was supposed to give you that happy life that you're looking forward to. But the more I learn about it and, and the more like, you know, I read things like Ephesians or experience it, I realize, oh, it's the difficulty of it is designed to make us less selfish people. And this is why it's hard. I mean, it's just like a workout. Like you 
you're going to hurt and you do it on purpose. So you're literally like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna put myself through suffering. What was that sign we were working out in your garage yesterday? You had um, seek dif discomfort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Because on like on uh, in some places of life, like exercise, we realize that the goodness is on the other side of pain. But I think we often don't think about marriage and family like that. And the, but the reality is that marriage and family, you know, it's a lot of centers in mm -hmm. one house. So you're gonna mm -hmm. have conflict. You're gonna have problems. But as you learn to forgive and as you learn to compromise, and you have to practice and work on it. That's where I see us 16 years later. We're much softer people. We're much happier people. Um, and I think we're much holier. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a difference between joy and happiness that I didn't appreciate. Mm. Until maybe like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so that takes a while. Joy and happiness. Are yeah, not like the you same don't. Thing. Joy is a deeper, um, it's partly a choice, but it's also born through perseverance and endurance. Mm. Like you become a joyful person when you let the circumstances of your life soften you rather than make you brittle and bitter. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think I spent a lot of my like first 20 years of my life running from anything hard because a lot of things came easy to me that worked. So I would just do things that were like I was good at. And then once marriage, but it was really more becoming a mom that mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not good at this. Mm -hmm. And this is asking and Sorry. I can't escape. It's literally mm -hmm. in my body, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. that I was like, whoa, I didn't realize how much of. And I think our American culture, this is a sneaky thing about America is like we sort of all, I think, believe we can escape hard things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually you can't. But if you like get to the end of yourself and ask for God to meet you in them, you can like become a stronger person and then be joyful in the, the midst of hard things. And so yes. that. Yeah. Wow. And joy is it's like I'm not I'm not happy all the time. <laughs> no. Summer has been hard, like four boys at home. Whew. It hasn't been a lot of happiness for me. Yeah. But I think like when I get some time to reflect and especially being away, I'm like, okay. There's a lot of joy in that. Mm. Yeah. How old are your boys? All right. I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the pro the problem like is it keeps changing every year. Oh okay? uh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> there's four of them. Yeah. They are right now four, six, nine, and eleven. Correct. Wow. So four boys. Lots of wrestling. <laughs> I can't imagine four boys. We have one who's two, and he's wild. He does seem wild. I love watching <laughs> and I can't these imagine four fitness. of him. <laughs> yeah. There's an exponential effect um, when there's not <laughs> a, a girl to sort of level things out yeah. or set a different like track. Um, they just become more boyish together, yeah. which is really fun. Yeah. But it's also really chaotic, very messy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a little bit scary. As I say, sure. yeah. <laughs> our sister-in-law has four boys and she came over and stayed with us over the weekend uh, a couple of weekends ago and she was watching our daughter just sit at a table and color and she's like, I don't understand this. And exactly. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I never experienced it. I was it. like, all she wants to do is paint and color all day. <laughs> yeah. Justin met Drew yesterday and she brought him her Barbie. <laughs> Yeah. And he was like, I'm I'm not used to this sweetness. This is so, <laughs> so sweet. She was showing it to me. Yeah. And I was like, what's this Barbie's name? And she's like, Barbie. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew right. You didn't know that was I the didn't name. I didn't know Barbie said it. Do yeah. they not have names? Yeah. Um, I knew. Well, there's one specific. The one you think of, that's her name. Yeah. There's yeah. other ones that have different names. We haven't seen the movie yet. We're behind the time. Well, seen she's either. also three, and so we're, our imagination is still okay. building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the point was this sweet, soft presence. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I was. And I'll be honest. Like, yeah. Sometimes we wish, you know, that we did have a girl in the mix. But yeah. God has given us four boys. I think he's calling us yeah. to learn how to raise men. So we'll lean into yeah. that call. We I still haven't, like, gotten to the stage where, like, the crayons aren't just broken. Like, we're 11 and a half years <laughs> in. Yeah. I was like, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. They do art at school. We can't do it at home. Well, yeah. <laughs> Justin was sharing that their date nights are best when it's philosophical, deep conversations. Mm -hmm. and I, that's when I knew we were going to get along. But <laughs> the, to your point about happiness versus joy, you're saying like one of two things is compounding. You're either compounding and growing your ability to like do good habits and like build good habits, or you're compounding this negative. You're trying to delay the pain, but that's really just compounding the size of what ultimately that pain will look like. Mm. Is yeah. that? Yeah, and I think what, being willing to accept grace, like part of that is saying like if you get if you if you think it's in your control to either escape or overcome the hard things on your own strength, mm. then you're gonna get better. Yes. But if you say like I need help from others, from God, and I'm gonna fail and I'm gonna have to 
like deal with that failure, then there can be like freedom yeah. in that. So I think that's where it. And I would I would add, like we're told in the scriptures that have joy in suffering. So there's sort of a basic understanding that we're not going to avoid suffering. It's out there. So you can choose your suffering and choose to endure it well, or you can try to avoid it and it will just come find you. Mm -hmm. But I look at, you know, the, the example of Jesus is that he suffered so that our life could, be, could flourish. And I think particularly in parenting, you start to realize, oh my gosh, that is the way of a parent. Like, I don't want to get up right now. <laughs> I don't want to give birth right now. I don't want to mm -hmm. work through this fight right now. But my call is not, hey, kid, you're going to make me happy. No, my call is to be like, let's be like Christ. I will suffer in this moment so you can flourish. You know, sometimes that's, I'll say no, I'll break up the argument, or I'll take the pain, I'll get up. But that, for me, that helps move it out of the, oh my gosh, I didn't expect parenting to be this hard. I wish I could just have a break to, oh, this is becoming more like Jesus. Th these are the, mm -hmm. the habits of the household, the rhythms, if you lean into them, they're opportunities to become more like Christ. And that is where we actually find happiness mm -hmm. in choosing to suffer on someone else's behalf. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, look, like the, we're on social media, YouTube, I, I love, and Instagram, and it's all these like, you know, David Goggins, Jocko type personalities where it's wake up and run a uh, ultra marathon or whatever <laughs> it is. And it's like, I, th I honestly think you guys are doing a fantastic job, but like th have so much uh, insight and awareness and com communicative skills that can change our generation. It's changed Sean and I's household and lives. But like, it's so important because what you're talking about is like, hey, the physical pain of a workout mm -hmm. is the most surface level example of this. And mm -hmm. it is like, hey, you do something hard and then like you have those endorphins afterwards physically. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But what if you extrapolate that to marriage over 40 years mm -hmm. and that pain right. looks like months or years of a tough mm -hmm. season yeah. or raising, it's like, that's that's a really long workout, you know, like a one, <laughs> that's, that's an endurance. But the joy on the other side of that, the endorphins on the other side, that's of right. like mm -hmm. yeah. anyway, and I think you guys are uniquely qualified to share that. So, well, thanks for uh, saying so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the gifts of becoming a parent is it's both the hardest thing we both of us have ever done, Absolutely. but there's a lot of media joy built into parenting. Oh my gosh. And like yeah. yeah. marriage too, but that's why like you can be joyful cuz you know, you're still like you know, at the end of a hard day where I've been wrung out by the boys and I'm like, I can't, <laughs> you know, make a coherent sentence. Uh, Justin will still be like, do you remember when Coulter said this yesterday? And I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. I love them so much. Yeah. And, you know, there's that built in, like, you know, just the way we're made that, you know, when you see your own child, you're just happy. So, mm -hmm. you know, they make you, they do both drive you crazy, but there's a lot of those, like, and to see that as like the gifts of it in the season and practicing gratitude is a lot of this too, mm -hmm. but mm. I'll, I will say, though, I mean, I haven't really been an athlete in forever because of lifestyle, but I do feel like actually you do build those muscles of endurance. Mm -hmm. You know, your body does matter and like practicing it in athletics mm -hmm. does start to build those like grit and perseverance and endurance that carry over into other things. So mm -hmm. I don't it may be surface level, but it's not it's legitimate. Yeah, 100. I, I think yeah. that's like the starting point, though. It's yeah. like, hey, everyone mm -hmm. can do a whatever it is, five minute or 15 minute or mm -hmm. whatever your threshold is to push them to a point of discomfort. But like, that's just the entry level of, <laughs> oh, yeah. of, yeah, of yeah. painful experiences of life. You that's know? right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Anyway. Well, I, and go ahead. I just want to add to, I think that the opposite side of this is like the happiness. And I feel like we have seen so many people, honestly, today's world, mm -hmm. they strive for immediate happiness and they don't know that's joy right. because every single moment is what can I do right now to make, me happy and not mm -hmm. angry, mad, just wanting to deal with a situation. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very scary path to go down because mm -hmm. if you keep doing that over and over and over again for a long time, you have no depth in your life. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have no meaning in your life. Yes. You have no joy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are really afraid of change or sacrifice because they think if you are angry, mad, sad, depressed in a moment because it's difficult, it can't possibly be right. Yes, yeah. I, I, it's really hard to not believe that. And yeah, and I, yeah. Every day I'm like, wait, this still means I'm supposed <laughs> to do this. Well, hard. Yeah. I even remember last night, I had a rough night with like 
feeding the kids, getting them down. It was just one of those where I felt like I was just the bad guy all night. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And we were going to bed, and I was like, just get our kids to sleep, whatever. <laughs> um, and our son, who's wild, and he's only two, he's not like a cuddly guy. He's just mm-hmm. always moving. He probably gave me a... 10 minute hug. Rare. Oh, rare. Just sat Such on the floor. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, this is cool. There you <laughs> yeah. go. Which turns everything around. But if you aren't willing to do the hard stuff, which is really, I, I don't know how you get people to buy into that. It, it's hard to convince people to even start because mm-hmm. it seems like such, such a monumental sacrifice that they're doing. Mm. Like, you want me to give up being happy for a possibility? Yeah. Totally. How did you guys start to discover these topics? You know, you've written now three books, right? Mm-hmm. Common Rule, Habits of the Household, and Made for People. Like, why? What, what started <laughs> this journey? Yeah, you know? right, I'll give you the attempt at a short story, and you interrupt whenever. So we we started our marriage as missionaries in China, which was awesome. Um, until I ha- I actually felt the Lord in China calling me to go back to the States to be missional in law and business, which is a super loaded statement on calling. We can come back Mm -hmm. to it. But I really did feel called to go to law school. And so I ran at it with all the fervor of a man on a call, just trying to do the best I could. And it did go well. Graduated toward the top of my class in Georgetown. Got my dream job in international mergers and acquisitions. Casual. Yeah, yeah, a big (laughs) law firm in Richmond. Um, But I didn't really realize at the time that while my head was full of these Christian thoughts of I'm a man on a call, my everyday habits were, had totally assimilated to the usual mm-hmm. practices of you know top law school students and young ambitious lawyering. And my life cratered my first year of lawyering. I started to have like all of a sudden one night um, really bad panic attacks. I didn't even know what that word was then, but I, I started mm-hmm. to not be able to sleep. I was, I, w- I was like scared all the time. My body was kind of going haywire. Um, and it was a really dark period for about 18 months because we had two boys at the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm worried about, like, can I keep my job? Can I pay back my student mm-hmm. debt? Can I be a you know, husband and a father? Um, I, I, what the Lord did during that time, and this was not easy. This is like on the conversation of like the Lord uses hard things and suffering to show you the best things. I started to realize that I actually your habits can go one way and your head can go the other way. So I believe this, but I'm acting like this. And your heart's going to follow the habit. So I started mm-hmm. to get converted to this nervousness and anxiety that my routines were worshiping. And there was one night where I sat down with two close friends and asked them to keep me accountable to this program of daily rhythms. And I didn't think it was going to matter at all. But Lauren and I had come up with some of mm-hmm. these like daily practices to sort of like rein in my chaos. And I was just with my two best friends, Matt and Steve, and asking them to keep me accountable to like living a little bit differently because medication wasn't working, counseling wasn't working. And within a couple months of living according to some careful daily rhythms, my life started to completely change. Not like all better all at once, but it was totally moving in a different direction. And I started to realize that habits are, your life is full of habits. They will form who you are spiritually, mentally, physically, and if you don't pick them on purpose, then some, then someone else is going to choose them for you. Mm-hmm. You're just going to go along with the normal cultural habits. And so there was little stuff like turning my phone off an hour each evening to actually be present with my family, uh, doing a practice of scripture before phone where I actually lo- read the Bible for a bit in the morning before I like opened my law emails. And this so reshaped my life that I started to be like, oh my gosh, these habits are everywhere. Mm-hmm. Why don't I start living like it? Um, and it, yeah, it changed, changed my life. And then I, and then I started to realize I wrote my first book, the common rule on these spiritual rhythms for everyday life. And then I realized I was managing my technology. Well, I was managing my busyness better. I was resting more, but I was still yelling at my kids every evening. <laughs> I was like, well, I should start thinking about how these habits of the household matter. And that led to mm. the se- this, this second book. So, um, this, this book, The Habits of the Household, is all about looking at the family rhythms and realizing that we become our habits and our <clears> kids <throat> become us. So the habits of the household are one of the most central parts of their spiritual formation. So let's, let's pay attention. Let's lean in. Let's pick them on purpose. Mm, that's good. And this is, I mean, this is shaped over your 
now 11 years of parenting, what's worked well? Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> we like talk about this and write from the trenches, not as experts, right? Like our oldest is 11. We're not like parents yeah. who've had tons of experience, but we are just trying to be honest about like what we're tinkering with, what we're working on, yeah. what we're trying. I mean, this, this whole book was initially born out of a night trying to put my four boys to bed. Actually, it was three at the time. You were pregnant with the fourth. Mm. And just, you know, bath water on the floor, fighting over toothbrushes and everything. And I, I finally get them into bed and tell them, God loves them. I do too. Say a quick <laughs> prayer. And like shut the door and I'm like, whoa. I just yelled them and muscled them into bed with like many threats of bodily <laughs> <Yeah>. harm. <laughs> and then I was like, I love you. God does too. And I'm like, what do they think that means? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. And it's just, it was just this humble moment of realizing that the things I talked about did not match how I acted at all. And so this book is an exploration of how could we align the practices to what we actually believe. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think it was like a lot around like, hey, we want to be intentional with our kids. But when you're a parent, you have no brain space to do that on the mm -hmm. fly. Like you have to like take some time and be like, how do we like make a rhythm and a habit of the most important things? And then once it's a habit, actually, it becomes a default. It's the autopilot. Yes, right. And so like that's like a lot of these things. We have some of them in the habits of the household that really are autopilot that really have like sunk in. But there's others we're always trying to restart because like we believe in that and we know there's so much fruit in life in that. But it's like it, you just your kids are, are changing and adapting. You're having hard seasons. Mm -hmm. You get sick and everything goes out the window. But if you have a few things that like actually you've put the time into, like mm. pick a habit, do like one for us is like we do morning prayer every morning and that um, is not something we have to, like our kids know. Like he's about to leave for work, take the kids to school. We gather at the front. It's like 25 seconds. But mm -hmm. I feel like that for me is so like great to be like, wait, this day is not my own. It belongs to God. Like, and he's going to meet me in it and we're going to ask for his help. And like, do our kids know what that means? No, but like that's something we just do and it's like, okay, whew, at least we had that today. And it's mm -hmm. not something we have to tell them to do. They just gather because we've done it for two years. And so that, like, it's not like we're spending time thinking of the prayer. We have one that it's like 10 seconds, everyone has it memorized, mm -hmm. you know? And so that just like, okay, we had a horrible week. I had to apologize to my kids for mm -hmm. losing my temper, but at least every morning we're gathering and being like, we're going to do this and, mm -hmm. and we don't have to come up with it. And I think a lot of this book is just, and half of these were like, oh, we need to, school starting, we need to like restart a bunch of those. Those are life-giving. Those are fruitful. But to have a few things that your family can return to, and it's going to look different in every season. And so this was like our, we found like a lot of parenting books weren't practical enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, yeah. we need some ideas. Mm -hmm. I need to see how other people are doing it. And a lot of this book is, we've been surrounded and blessed by so many amazing parents and our friends and, yes. and our, both of our parents so that we were like, God's given us all this wisdom from these amazing people that he put us around. So we got to share that with the world. So it's not just things we came up with. A lot of this is like our parent, like his, Justin's older sister and her husband have kids who are just two years older than us. And it's just like, you know, that's a gift. Yeah. So th those kind of mentors are like amazing to have. So. I don't know about, your group but we do a women's group it's like the wives and the husbands mm -hmm. and we've both read this book at like in our group separately and oh you didn't coordinate well they read it first and he andrew is always such kind raving of like reviews a... <laughs> like, okay i sent you a picture but a game night will have like 50 people yeah, over yeah. i i have stacks of that book yeah. to like amazing. hand out and so take cool. it. but this has probably been the book that hit all of the wives and moms the mm. hardest. I have the oldest kids of our group. Everybody has like newborns oh, so and like little, little, little ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And every mom is just terrified of what their kids are going to look like in six years. Mm. Because they're so, they're drowning in yes. new parenthood. Right. Of like, how do I raise a human? <laughs> and how do I raise a human well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do I need to be doing? And they read this book and they're like, wait, what? I this makes sense and it's easy, but I didn't know that my habits form me and mm. form my children. And yeah. it's mm. it's a terrifying thought, but it is it's spelled out so practically that it made everyone kind of like breathe a breath of fresh air. I'm good. And be okay. like good. It it's that exact like bathwater moment yeah. that we all oh my god felt human over and we're like, right. Oh yeah, yeah. I screamed at my kid tonight and then yeah. I was like, Love you, see you in the morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think yeah. the most powerful like message that I've heard from I think it's a Christian psychologist who said, you know, the 
the thing that should be common is reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. that is actually going to be healing yes. to your kids. Like you can't, there's always going to be rupture. But re- if reconciliation is a habit, your kids will be whole people. Mm. They won't come out flawed. You know, like mm. they're going to be, have that like. Wow. And I just, yeah, I'm every day I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I lost my temper again. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I have a chance to either like beat myself up about it, yeah. which is my temptation, or I have a chance to like humble myself and be like, I'm sorry, mom lost her temper again. Will you forgive me? And that's what they're going to remember. Yeah. Mm, yes. And like believing that's actually true yeah. because other parents have told me so. And because like, I mean, one of Justin's most strong memories of like being an adolescent is his parents forgiving him. Oh, yeah. Mm. And that has shaped him totally. so much. So, I, and I think it's important to be honest about all the difficulty and the messiness up front mm-hmm. because when you talk about habits, people can start to think about productivity and streamlining life and creating a nice orderly household Mm -hmm. and this and i just try to be really upfront at the very beginning of this book this is not what i'm talking about yeah i mean like in that messy (laughs) bath time bedtime moment that i was that that's what sparked me this journey for me because i realized how difficult this actually is and so we started doing this bedtime liturgy shortly after that as a way to sort of rein in the chaos of that evening Mm -hmm. like just like i had a couple years before been like i need some patterns to rein in the chaos of my lawyering I was like, how can we rein in the chaos of this, these bedtime moments? And so we started this little back and forth um, question and answer where I, where I asked them, can you see my eyes? And they say, yes. And I say, can you see that I see your eyes? And they say, yes. And I say, do you know that I love you? Mm-hmm. And they say, yes. Then I say, do you know that I love you no matter what bad things you do? Yes. Do you know that I love you no matter what good things you do? Yes. And then I say, who, who else loves you like that? God does. And then rest in that love is the end. And there's this like little pattern that we made up. And at first it was awful. Like when I was like, <laughs> yeah. can you see my eyes? And they were like, poke me in the eyes. Like, <laughs> those eyes, you know? And the, the first time I asked them, do you know that I love you no matter what bad things you do? They're like, no, <laughs> um, you don't. Because I, I was like, oh, this is really bad. Yeah. But, but I kept practicing because I knew enough about habits at that point to know that nothing's mm-hmm. normal until it is. And there was, it was just like two weeks later, like after that first bath time episode, that there was an evening where it was still messy. There was definitely still bath water on the floor. And I was still struggling with my own temper. But Asher, I think it was, our second oldest, was laying in bed and was like, can we have our bedtime blessing now? Oh. And we went through this same exchange. And it was this moment of me realizing the words I was getting them to say were true for me too. Mm-hmm. That God loves me and them no matter how misbehaved mm-hmm. we all were on that evening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's when I I, you know, I remember shutting the door that night and having another hallway epiphany of realizing that working on these kind of habits of the household is is not because they're easier not because they make it all clean but they actually changed the way I approached my children mm-hmm. and suddenly mm. I was like oh this is changing my knee-jerk reaction to the difficulties it's not going to change the circumstances or the difficulties it's just going to change my reaction to them and that's why I was like, oh, this is grace. This is grace everywhere. It just means that I don't have to respond to this moment like I usually respond. There's another option. And so I always try to remind people when we're talking about habits of the household, habits are not going to change God's love for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like he loves you no matter what. He loves your children no matter what. It's just that God's love for us should change our habits. Mm-hmm. And that's where you enter this realm of you can do this out of grace, not out of earning. Mm-hmm. And that makes a huge difference right there. It's amazing You've done this in both of these books. Um, take a pretty ambiguous, like random, highly varying thing like household habits mm-hmm. or friendship and made, you've broken it down into practical, tangible, like, oh, I can digest that. And for me, like, that's what that book did. Even breaking it down into the 10 phases of the day, mm. I was like, oh, Man, that's so helpful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is so like, okay, this is this little meal phase that lasts a half hour for dinner right now. The kids sit down for maybe five minutes, but it's like, okay, that's a that's little normal. Hour. Right. That's normal. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, that's, <laughs> it really tests me. Something yeah. is better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You, know? you guys are right there. Yeah. Yeah. And we're done. Okay. Yeah. But it's like yeah. uh-huh. just even breaking it down into those different compartments of the day, like it allows me to walk into that and be like, okay. I got, you know, this small portion of the day, there's an opportunity to do something unique or like going to bed, yes. there's an opportunity. Yes. And it's like, you know, 
I guess I studied calculus in college, and the big thing is wow. like taking an integration, which is like break one big. You thing. already lost me. I, <laughs> <laughs> you're a lawyer, bro. I don't do math. You take yeah. you take like one big overwhelming problem and you break it down into little smaller parts. Yes. Is how you yes. conquer that, yes. and it's like wow. I never thought because when the baby, when you have like a two month old and they're supposed to be napping, but they wake up and like you know you have chores to do, but then you don't. It's like it can feel so overwhelming. It and is. You're just trying to keep it, and it's like no, okay. There's little, we can break these down into smaller parts yes. and like make it through this well, which is amazing. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Well, th no, but, thank you. I mean, and it's a good point. It's like, kind of like what you were saying earlier, Sean. You people get scared of a big, hard thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to make myself dissatisfied. But most of life are, is tiny little decisions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is habit. And the good news about this stuff is you don't have to change all your life at once. You can't actually, yeah. but you can practice Mm -hmm. little things yeah. and these habits aggregate i think it was annie dillard who said our days become our lives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what i like about this stuff is just humbling yourself and realizing let's just try a thing or two today mm -hmm. not try to change my whole life tomorrow but but they stack they aggregate yeah mm -hmm. and i just can't emphasize enough <laughs> it's not easy when we start a habit or restart mm -hmm. it no i mean the, the family prayer thing like everybody was like punching each other for like six months in family yeah. prayer. Like, no, I'm not exaggerating. Like <laughs> we have four boys. They're always fighting. And just like, just to <laughs> encourage you, like it's not anything like worth doing is going to be hard with your kids at first. And so like, don't feel like, well, my kids are not just cut out for this. Like, of course, pick things that are developmentally appropriate. Like we're, yeah. we're not going to have a dinner conversation with <laughs> our six and four year old. They eat and then they run around the house. Yeah. But our 11 year old can stay and talk with us now. So we do that, yeah. you know, but if you've picked something that you think is doable, it's still gonna like be pulling teeth for a month. Yeah. That makes me feel better because I've yeah. been expecting my three and two year old to sit and talk with us. Mm. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. no. <laughs> so, uh, maybe your girl. I don't know. I don't know about girls. <laughs> I have no, no idea. <laughs> she's still good and done. She wants to have like a two minute conversation and then she's like, Mommy, can I go? And I'm like, Sure. Yes. Yes. I cannot em emphasize enough. If you, if you listening have small kids, check out Habits of the Household. They break the, the day down into different phases and then at the end of the chapter they'll go through and give you like prompts of things to try things to say how to think about things. and it's so helpful and at the at the very least for us it's it takes a bit of courage as like a man or a, a you know like a husband or wife to say you know you got a 11 year old son and you're trying to mm -hmm. enforce yeah. new habits it's like mm -hmm. it's like it takes a kind of uh some amount of courage to oh, say yeah. hey we're gonna do this prayer that we haven't done before and it, but now it's like, hey, I read this book. Let's try this out. You know, it's almost like a third party to say, this is their fault. We're trying this, you know, <laughs> yeah. to some degree. You know what I'm saying? I'll raise my, yeah. I'm happy for yeah. people yeah. to blame me. Just yeah. be like, hey, I read this guy. We should try it out. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. if, you know, if you're a wife listening to this, you know, just send this to your husband. Justin said so. Just yeah. try it out. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> they don't like it, then it comes out to me. <laughs> I think that's a, a real thing. So you've incredibly practical guide to household habits with that book. I'm not going to lie. When we were talking about made for people, I was like, okay, friendship. How do you talk about friendship in a meaningful way? It's like, I'm a human. I have friends. I know how to do this thing. <laughs> and then I read this, bro. And I was like, oh my gosh, same experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas like two for two, all you, right. pro you provided <laughs> vocabulary and like, literally there's a roadmap in here. I don't know where it is. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A roadmap of like, hey, here's how you break down Here's how you progress through a friendship. Um, and I was convicted, though, because I was like, I'm, I've am i been doing it wrong. I've been doing friendship wrong, man. We're friendship floaters. That's what we are. I came up yeah. with that term last night. And I, I, I think we're I've been, to some degree, we've been like uh, disloyal to some of our friends. But I will say one of my favorite things about this book is just the concept we post on social media a lot that we host these game nights mm -hmm. and it's basically like a, a community builder for people yes. to make friends and mm -hmm. to like meet yeah. other people as adults. But we get questions all the time of like, how do you make friends yeah. as an adult? Yeah. That's not superficial. Right. That's not surface level. That's not just like you see him once and you never talk to him again, but how do you mm -hmm. actually create mm -hmm. meaningful friendships when when you're our age yeah. Yeah. and it's, it's hard. so difficult yeah. it's really uh -huh. hard it's really hard and, and it's so shocking how many people like you say are so lonely because they don't know where to yep. begin yeah so, i mean and that's this is where the impetus for this book came 
because when you get to this phase of life, you know, it's really just a couple years after college, if you're paying attention, you start to realize that the current of American life is flowing hard and fast towards mm -hmm. loneliness. Like nobody is <coughs> pushing you into friendship anymore. Um, and the drift of American life is to become busier, wealthier people who used to have friends. Mm -hmm. And so many people look up in their 30s and they're like, all right, I've got a, I got a job, I got kids, I'm married, and I am totally alone. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing just like that discomfort. But the other, if you look at the stats right now, like the Surgeon General of the United States released a huge report in, in June of 2023, about like six weeks. Mm -hmm. like we were talking in August here. Um, just detailing how we're dying younger because of loneliness mm. like a stat in there is that chronic loneliness reduces your life expectancy to the tune of smoking 15 cigarettes a day so it's like it's a health problem on the level of obesity or or tobacco but you know a lot of us think that loneliness is someone else out there like like somebody locked away in an apartment mm -hmm. but really th this is just regular life like most americans are lonely they might not name it that but they're mm -hmm. living a life where they see people they're around other people, but they're not known by them mm -hmm. anymore. And that's what I'm talking about in this book, is that how to how to create racial relationships where you are known fully and yet loved fully by someone else. And that's actually called friendship. <laughs> we've we've like forgotten the significance of that word, but real friendship is a deep relationship with somebody who sticks with you. And surprise, surprise, that's a reflection of the gospel. Like that's how Jesus loves mm -hmm. us. He knows us fully and sticks with us anyway. And so I'm, I'm trying to help people see that this is actually a deep physical and spiritual hunger in your life. And no one's going to help you do it. You, you have to live intentionally to do it. Mm. What was this book root, rooted in? Like, was this a personal experience that you guys went through? or? Well, my I'm curious for your answer. My answer would be, I actually, since high school, have had really close friends, praise God, who have kept me in my walk with the Lord the way that I would not be who I am today without them. Um, and I'm seeing that blessing alongside the world's crisis of, oh my gosh, our culture needs this really badly. Um, but I know for, for us, you know, we have close friends, Lauren does too, but it's, this is a hard phase of life to actually do it. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it, we're looking at all the stuff we just talked about in parenting and saying, you can't do this stuff alone. You need other people in your life to be a good spouse to be a good husband or wife, to be a good parent. Um, so it's something we're also working on. It's not easy. What would, what would you yeah, say? Yeah, I would say, like, I think this book is born out of, like, something that we've seen in our life that has saved us, that has mm -hmm. been life-saving. And how did, what were the choices we made to, like, keep friends and, and fight for friendship in a time of the past 10 years when it's felt like we should, that was impossible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it comes a lot out of just, we've had this incredible gift of having people in our life and how what were the things we did and they did that allowed that and I can and just like people that have shaped us like I remember like nine years ago there was a speaker um James K. Smith at our church and he just shared that this one other couple him and his wife were like we're gonna have wine um on Tuesday nights and the other couple had older kids so they always came to them and he was like and we canceled it half the time because of sick kids but these were our people and we just like shared life with them and Justin and I were like we need a standing for mm -hmm. them like it's never gonna happen you know just like sure. that person they they spoke that into us and we were like okay and so for a while we tried with our you know our, our best friends who are married and to do it together and then that didn't really you know that mm -hmm. faded and then it was like how does justin have a standing in time he's going to meet with his two guy friends and that gets canceled a lot but just having that rhythm and realizing that there's like arts and habits to friendship that allow it to be possible but you actually have to make it like something that this is a make or break thing. And yeah. I think that's that's like my key message is like, I felt like I had no time for friends. I still do mm -hmm. feel like that. But I need to make time for my yes. friends. And I need to like when I'm tired and feel like I can't form coherent thoughts, still be vulnerable mm -hmm. or find a time or get up early, whatever. Yes. And like I've sacrificed other things. Like I was saying the other day to someone like I there was a mom's group that met in the morning and it was I had two mornings of preschool. My older kids are in school finally, but my little one's still in preschool. So I had two hours and 45 minutes, two mornings a week. Mm -hmm. I desperately wanted to use that time to get yeah. stuff done. Yeah. And right. I was like, you know what? No, I'm going to go to this, this Bible study with my mm -hmm. five other friends and I'm going to actually show up. And I'm glad I made that decision. It was also really hard 
to be like, I'm going to use mm-hmm. that time that way mm-hmm. because my house is a mess, you know, and I don't like that. And there's so many things. So just like to say like, okay, what does it mean to choose relationship over like what seems like essentials mm-hmm. yes. sometimes? But re- ju- I think Justin has made an amazing case in this book that this is essential. Mm. Like friendship is essential to your life in this stage, especially like to, to everyone, but especially as a, a young parent, you yeah. need to be seen by other people and to mm-hmm. have them. I know I keep sharing stories, but last night I had women's group. Mm-hmm. We had Bible study. And at the very end of it, I've missed the past probably three or four that we've times we've met. Which has been my fault, and I apologize. No, 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 no. <laughs> At least one uh, of those. That had nothing to do with you. Should we talk about this? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it had nothing to do with him. But one of the girls, my, I, my tendency is like when I get really busy, when I get really overwhelmed, mm-hmm. I retreat. Yeah. Yes. Like exactly. I don't tend to like lean into friendships, nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was really refreshing. One of the girls called me out and she said, I just want to ask. Yeah. She's like, you haven't been here. <gasps> Good for her. And she's like, we miss you. Oh. And we need you to be a part of this group. Mm-hmm. So and it was it That's was true. this like, mm-hmm. I felt guilt, but I also felt so seen. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Different than you feel with a spouse, different than you feel with family. That's awesome. And I was like, thank you. Well, who said that? I've missed you, V, oh, obviously. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I love but that. it was such a like a, I was like, it was that feeling of like, this is what friends are. Mm. And like, you get so wrapped up in life that you forget that, it's more than just this like surface level thing. Yes. But it was so powerful. I, I was love really that there's like a, a gentle but like honest calling Yeah, and <laughs> they're like, out. uh. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. what true friends are. Like, <laughs> they yeah. really, I mean, I feel like the, the best <clears throat> single piece of advice I have is to make friends in your 30s is to be awkward. To be awkward yeah. and honest. Yes. Yeah. And she, you know, that's I a love lot that. for her. It is. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. it was so good. This, I think there's a, there's a reason that's so significant. So in, in the book, I, I start in Genesis with this idea that God in Genesis chapter two looks at Adam and says, it's not good that you're alone, mm-hmm. which is a really wild statement if you think about it, because God's talking to him and it's like, you're lonely. And if you're Adam, <laughs> yeah. aren't you looking back and like, but I got you, you're here. You know? like, yeah. Can you imagine like being on a date with your spouse and you're like, this is a great dinner, except I'm so lonely. <laughs> You'd be like, what? <laughs> so it should, it's actually a jarring sentence because it's this idea that God is saying to Adam, you can't experience me the way that you were made to experience me until you experience me alongside yeah. other people. Yeah. Which is like, oh, that's that's a theologically interesting statement. And then just a couple of verses later, you get this beautiful moment at the end of Genesis 2 where Adam and Eve are naked and unashamed, which means like they're mm-hmm. fully known to each other and th- but there's nothing to hide. Mm-hmm. And God God is there too. You know, he's like there's they're known but yet fully loved. Mm-hmm. So like those two things, fully known and fully loved. And then right a couple verses later, this paradise falls apart because right after sin enters the garden, the first thing Adam and Eve do is fig leaves and bushes. So they mm-hmm. hide from each other and then they hide from God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and the reason I, this, this like, I'm going to try to make this connect to what you just said is life after the fall, like the world that we live in, we are built to hide. Mm-hmm. Like we, we try to hide our mistakes, the fig leaves from other people, and we try to hide our mistakes from God. But one of the coolest things about that same passage in Genesis 3 is that God comes out and says, where are you? Mm-hmm. Like, he is already a friend. He's like, where Where are you? He knows they're hiding. It's like our toddler under the bed sheets. Like, <laughs> we know where you are, but we play, yeah. where are you? I'm looking for you. And God comes out and he looks for us. And that theme, we could spend all day talking, continues mm-hmm. through the Bible. Mm-hmm. Like, through the whole story of Jesus coming to find us and telling us in John 15 that we are actually his friends. And... That is to say a good friend is somebody who knows you mm-hmm. and loves you anyway and will come find you and mm-hmm. be like, hey, you haven't been here or you're not telling me the whole, like, are you not sharing something? And those are the people you need in your life to mm-hmm. pull you out of from behind the bushes, from behind the fig leaves and say, I know you and I love you anyway. And suddenly you're like in a friend, you see Jesus. And that's why it's so important. Mm. Giving people a practical takeaway if they're listening. Um, where's a place adults can find friends? Mm. Well, this, all right, the practices do get hard here. Like you got to realize that it's important, like to mm-hmm. care about it. Um, but it is a really good question of like, wait, so how do we do this now? 
And I'll just, I'll give you one example. There's, I think there's a ton of ways, but I'll give you one example that's been really true for me. So if you're going to do anything significant, like we've been talking about, you got to figure out how to make it a rhythm in your life. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I love you guys game night idea is because mm -hmm. you're trying to create a countercultural routine mm -hmm. that says, instead yeah. of just being people who are always doing other things and too busy to do anything, let's come together. Right. So you need to look at your life and say like, what is a rhythm I can put in place that's actually possible? even if we mess up a lot, that will actually pull us together. And so for me, my best friends, Matt and Steve, these are the two who almost saved my life through helping me create these habits and the mm -hmm. common rule um, that I talked about. We've set up a rhythm right now where every other Tuesday night, we just meet on one of our porches and talk. And yes, we all have young kids. And yes, then we travel and then we miss some and we approximate the rhythm. But that's okay because rhythms aren't rules. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're guidelines. They help you out. And in doing this for for years now like this incredible thing has happened we just we sit together on the porch every other tuesday night ish and we talk and we laugh we share about our wives and our kids and our jobs and our internet history and everything else that we're worried about and mental health problems blah 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 and over the course of that small rhythm i have become a person without secrets mm -hmm. which is really important I, for, for any guy it was for any or any girl but i mean it's so easy to hide behind the fig leaves. But setting up a little rhythm like that where you do this radical thing called actually just telling the truth to each other week after week, that one hour will fundamentally change your life. And anything else that is really that important in life, you have to do all the time. Sleeping all the time, mm -hmm. parenting all the time, working all the time. But one hour of friendship every week or so will completely change everything else. So whether it's a rhythm like that, a game night, a small group, um, a Friday night bonfire that you just like do every once in a while, those things are way more powerful than you think. And I would just encourage people to say, pick one little rhythm and just try to hold to it mm -hmm. and become over time a person without secrets. It will change your life. Mm. To your point about a rhythm not being a rule, it's like every Tuesday night there or every other Tuesday night, there is this expectation that we will meet together, which can make a big difference. Like if I'm going through something bad, yeah. It's like, okay, well, I can share this on Tuesday, right? Or like mm -hmm. there's this expectation of like there some Bingo. amount of this weight will, can be lifted at this point, right? It's like yes. a, a point on the calendar that you can look towards. But, that is a huge – I want to tell you that, that – I'm actually getting like a little goosebumps right now as you're saying that because seriously, in my life, I think anybody who lives a normal life, like we're all sinners, mm -hmm. right? We are all broken people. You live one regular week and you've got a couple things you're ashamed of. <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah. you live one regular day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you've got a couple things that you're like, oh. But when I know, like Andrew, just what you said, when I know that I've got a friend who will hear me out on that yeah, and then tell me, hey, God loves you anyway, and so do I. Mm. My, the character of my week, like it's not, I don't carry it like a shameful secret that I have to hide. It's just like the burden is like lifted. Like David mm -hmm. writes in the Psalms, when, when I did not cry out to you, my bones burned within me when I did not confess. And you're like, your bones will burn unless you have people to talk to like this. Mm -hmm. And so I just like what you said, it's like it's totally different to live your life knowing that you can t tell this to somebody. But to Lauren's point, creating those rhythms, like there's an opportunity cost to everything, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. hey, to meet with a women's Bible study, the opportunity cost is a dirtier household or less yeah. organized right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or like yep. hey to have that tuesday night hang out with the boys you're not going to watch your favorite netflix series so it's like mm -hmm. but and that, I, now i have to do bedtime yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's an yeah. opportunity cost for each other yeah. you know and that's key too in your relationships to be like this is worth it and i've i've seen it prove that it's worth yeah. it but you know on the front end it's like yeah especially when you're trying to go from someone who's a friend who you know well mm -hmm. who you jive with to a deep friend mm-hmm mm where like you take that next step of vulnerability, that takes time. And, you know, he's had the gift of these people being friends forever, but they had to go through the awkward stage of like, so we're like friends for like a years, right? You know, like they had to have these like awkward conversations and, you know, that takes the time to build the trust. And so you got to put in the time in the early years of mm -hmm. a friendship or the early stage to be like, okay, like this is a sacrifice. It's, it's worth it. It's, it's going to take a while. And the trade off, I mean, I do think it's really important to name the trade offs because. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's easy. Like anything important is is hard. Mm -hmm. It's just worth it. I mean, I would rather live a life without secrets than I would have 
than I, I would rather live a life without secrets than have like an Instagram worthy house. Mm -hmm. mm. I would rather be known by friends than have an enormous net worth. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is a trade off, and that's why we have, have to help each other. You know, I have to take mm -hmm. care of the kids and put them to bed so that Lauren can go to this book club that she loves. That there's mm -hmm. great conversation or. And, you know, ask her to cover for me when I meet with Matt and Steve. And so we have to help each other do this. But it, it comes from that understanding that this is worth the dishes still being in the sink for. Because mm -hmm. I need to order my interior life before I need to order this, you know, kitchen. Well, and I think a lot of people have a really hard time understanding that and seeing that. Because I even have friends who have, I have tried to convince to join women's group or whatever. Or ha let their husbands join men's group or whatever. And they're like, oh, I, I could never. I could never mm. take that time away and not be with my kids or not have help to put the kids to sleep or whatever it is. Wow. And it's it's really interesting to see how people are so tight gripped around life. Interesting. And they think that their happiness lives that way mm. when I've noticed a huge difference. Like in Andrew even, when he is able every other week right? to meet with his guys yeah, talk to them about whatever he needs to talk to them That's about. Right. It's not meant for me. Yeah, <laughs> I, well, I, I, like, you I, can't yeah. bear that burden. Like no. you shouldn't have to. Yeah. And and that's like the, when we send our spouses out to go find friendship, mm -hmm. we do so with this great confidence that they're going to come back a better mm -hmm. husband, a better mm -hmm. wife, and a better parent. So I always tell people if, if your spouse is your only friend, you're mm -hmm. being a very bad friend to them because mm -hmm. <laughs> you need other like really mm -hmm. deep same sex relationships to, to help you be the husband you ought to be, help you be the wife you ought to be. And if you don't get away from your kids, I want to tell this to the, all the moms <laughs> yeah. out there, and I think you'd agree. Yeah. If you don't get away from your kids and have some adult time with other moms, yeah. you're not going to be a good mom. Like your kids need you to have friends. Yeah. yeah. And they need to see you have friends. Well, mm -hmm. it also teaches them how to have friends right. and that friends are important. Yeah. important. One of our favorite things is that both of our kids are always up for game night for at least an hour before they go to that. bed. Yeah. Because people come <clears> over at six. And I just keep thinking, like, in my mind, they will always know that mom and dad opened their house to people. Yes. And I think that's really, really yeah. fun. Justin talks about that in Habits of the Household, but hospitality yeah. has mm -hmm. been, like, borne out in the research as one of the things that helps kids, like, stick to their faith. Mm -hmm. Because, like, mm -hmm. hospitality is, like, so key to, like, God welcoming us into his mm -hmm. family. And, like, when we welcome others even into our mess in hospitality is, you know, messy house. Yeah. Opening your home. Yep. That's, like, I mean, that's important. Mm -hmm. Like, that will help them. One, one thing that caused a bit of uh, <clears throat> conflict when it was written about in the book was let your guests help with the dishes, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there was, I mean, we're in the South here, right? And mm. like there was quite a bit of like, I would never ever do that. This was a discussion. Tell us the the <laughs> heart behind that. Um, I, th I think there's just a honesty to, to realizing if, if you're going to have people in your life Actually, they're going to have to come into the mess of your life because and this is one of my friends. I think Drew was the first one to say this to us mm -hmm. that, you know, ho hospitality, entertaining is when you bring people into a clean house with no problems. Hospitality is when you invite people into your mess. Mm. And it's just like if, if our house had to be perfect and we had to do all the work, then we would never actually do real hospitality. We'd never actually bring people in. So letting them help with it um, is the only way it can actually happen. <laughs> Like when our friend Drew comes over and has family dinner with us, he he stays and helps with the dishes. And the rhythm wouldn't be possible if he didn't do that. Right. Yeah. So, you know, shared work equals shared community. I think it's part of both the humility to admit the life stage and the opportunity cost mm -hmm. of like the only way like you can meaningfully have friends when you have small children is for that work to be mm -hmm. part of. And like likewise, like if we go over to someone's house, like we're going to, um, you know. Yeah, there's just a work trade off. I I did want to nuance your point earlier Go. about the like the moms who are like I mm -hmm. don't because I, I do think it's different when you first become a mom. Yes. Um, I think it takes a little longer. We do need to call first time moms out of it if it's too long, but it's it's different for everyone because it's just if you're nursing, it's just you need to, as other mom friends, you need yeah. to go be with that person. Yes. You need to bring them food. They don't ask for it. Yep. Just bring them food, and you need to go like sit yeah. with them because they That's can't. Good muster mm -hmm. and it takes a long time to get out of that phase so i feel yeah. like there's a lot of grace yes the key That's here great. is is it a rhythm like is friendship something that is not having friends the unusual season for you mm -hmm. or is it the mm -hmm. usual season mm -hmm. and so like was, for me like that was, that was good. he got a he got a <laughs> lot more time with guy friends 
when my kids were zero to five. Yeah. And that was something I had to grieve, mm-hmm. honestly. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I was like, I want to see my friends too, but I don't get to as much. But now I do because our mm-hmm. oldest can babysit. That mm-hmm. <laughs> um, was awesome. Or a little, yeah, we're, we're transitioning to that. But yeah, it's just <laughs> a lot easier mm-hmm. with, when I'm not nursing mm-hmm. to make things happen. And just to be like, what is the, everyone's different, but how do I go come alongside other women mm-hmm. in that time? And how do I push myself to do the like, okay, it's been four months with my second, it's time. Mm-hmm. Yes. I don't feel ready and I don't feel cute. And I don't, yeah. you know, and I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. But like, I gotta, yeah, I gotta just show up. Yes. Yeah. You know, and so like that. And I a good think friend is, will come pull you out. Right? And, yeah. and yeah. To, you know, Justin said this to the men. Well, like, step up, help your wife do that. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, is really important. But also, like, wife be understanding that there's going to be some imbalance there, yeah. and that's still good for him. Well, and I would even say to like husbands, because I know a lot of all of our friends are brand new parents. There are so many of those moms who are like, oh, I promise I'm good. I want to stay home. No, they're Justin very Justin has lonely. pushed me out of the house so many times. Yeah. He's been like, you need to leave. Yeah. He was like, yeah. I have this. Yeah. And 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 also when you when I come back, the dishes have to, like, if he's going to have it, it has to be really, like, you got to finish. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so it's like, that that you was some learning curve too. Of like, yeah. if you yeah. got this and I come home and the next morning, it's like, a disaster that's not good that's just it. postponing yeah. the work for yeah you to do, so right? like yeah. agreed he, but he he does he would be like nope i'm sorry here you know and i i couldn't even do the thinking he would be like go to this you know juice place yeah. and get a juice and just like sit there i don't yeah. care but yeah. also go see your friends mm-hmm. and that is you gotta do that too let's take a break what is happening yeah, what did know. you do to your mic Shana? it just what happened dude <laughs> it literally fell off i saw you twisting it and now i realize sorry, i didn't even realize that <laughs> it's okay yeah. today's show is brought to you by better help i used to struggle with falling asleep at night because my mind would be racing thinking about everything i needed to get done and it felt impossible to turn my brain off it's like i knew i needed to sleep in order to have energy for the next day but my brain kept getting in the way of what i needed it to do i know what you mean and that would happen to me even during the day I would be trying to relax, but my mind would fill with thoughts about so many of the random things like work or kids. And this is a big reason that Sean and I are firm believers in therapy because Mm -hmm. it can help remove distraction and help you figure out what's holding you back from being your best. I agree. Andrew and I are very open about being supporters of therapy because we've seen the benefits in our lives firsthand. It's nice to be able to talk to a third party about what you're struggling with so you can help your mind work for you and not against you. And honestly, having little kids, it's, it's <laughs> nice to just sometimes talk to a fellow adult yes. every once in a while. Yes. But if you're considering therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you could switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. It's such an easy way to incorporate therapy into your routine because it's entirely online, so you can meet with your therapist whenever is best for you. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash EastFam today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash EastFam. We'll also link it down below. One thing I found challenging about this, you broke down what it means to share versus what it means to be vulnerable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually realized, like, I I don't know how to be vulnerable. It's really hard. It's hard. Mm -hmm. You have to have self-awareness and there needs to, like... To have self-awareness, you need time to reflect on like, well, how do I actually feel and what are my emotions on mm-hmm. this and what is going wrong? Because you broke, you, you even made a chart of like, this is sharing, this is right. vulnerability. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, chart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big chart guy. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I, this does not come naturally to me. Yeah. But. T- I know this. <laughs> I am aware of that. <laughs> uh, well, a, a good spouse or a good friend will like pull you out and help you mm-hmm. with this. But I think it is important to note this is not easy, right? In fact, theme, everything we're talking about, nothing of it is easy. It's just all yeah. important, all right? Important things are generally hard. Being vulnerable is is one of them. And I just say maybe two things about it. it. It does take practice. So sharing is sort of giving people the abstract overview of your life. But I was an English major, and you learn as a writer that like high level overviews are boring. People want character details, mm-hmm. like in the shows and movies we watch. And so saying, you know, Lauren and I are in a rough patch is different than saying we almost woke the kids up with our shouting last night and somebody threw something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that was a detail mm-hmm. that's like, oh, you're actually human like mm-hmm. us. Um, or saying, you know, work was really stressful my first year as a lawyer is different than saying I couldn't go to sleep unless I drank or took pills. 
and I'm saying both of these are like real examples from our lives, so like mm-hmm. real. And those, I think the important thing to note about being not just a person who shares, but a person who's vulnerable and gives details is that that is what actually moves the fig leaves mm-hmm. to let other people know you fully. They, you can't be fully known until you're vulnerable. But that means you, can, you can't be fully loved either because mm-hmm. people can't really love you until they know the whole you. And so, yes, it's hard. And actually the root of the, the Latin um, and vulnerable is to be made capable of being wounded. So it is literally like to give somebody else the weapon, your secrets with which to hurt mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is worth it because that's where you're, you're actually known. Mm. And it, take, it takes <clears throat> practice, but it is, it is worth it. I would say this is like a something is better than nothing example for being like in the mom years where you like can't find the time for the two of you to meet face to face. I've had like a lot of my vulnerability with other some of my key mom friends in the stage of life is like us texting like I just yelled at my kids worse than I ever have like Mm -hmm. five minutes ago and I need you to know that and I and Mm -hmm. usually there's so much guilt with that and it's like me being like yeah that's not okay but the most important thing is did you say you're sorry did you Mm -hmm. And like us like texting live back mm-hmm. and forth and being like, whoa, yeah, I, I didn't just have a hard day with the kids. I actually yeah. like shared like, I need you to pray for me now because I, I really am mad still and I want to <laughs> forgive yeah. them, but I'm having trouble. You know, that mm-hmm. kind of like actual real time, like I think technology is a gift there. It, like, it, it's not true. always a gift, yeah. but like when I can't see someone for like a month because we're playing phone tag with like the dates, at least we can text. And, and that's not with everyone. That's with a couple people. But like we already had that, and then and then the most important thing that a friend can do is to say you're forgiven, mm-hmm. let it go. You loved anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and I can't say that to myself in those moments. I don't feel forgiven. I don't That's feel right. like I can move on from my day. I feel guilty, and I need my friend to be like, no, they're not going to forget this. They're going to remember that you said you're sorry wow. and move on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where like. Okay, I'm so glad we have a phone in that moment. Yes. I want to keep it away from me mostly when I'm parenting, but on those days I need to like go have a minute. Mm-hmm. With and my just friend. encourage people in that, just r- real quick. What feels like scary vulnerability to you is going to look like bravery to the other person, mm-hmm. which is actually like when my friends tell the truth about their life, I'm always like, thank you so much for sharing. Mm-hmm. You know, so what it's just, you know, encouragement. It's going to feel scary to you. But to the person sitting on the other side of the table, they're going to be think, oh, that was courageous. And they're also going to be inspired to share their life, too. Mm-hmm. So vulner- vulnerability catalyzes vulnerability. And that's the soil where real friendship begins to grow. You even gave a script of <laughs> a, call, a phone call for what you do with your, right, yeah. with your uh, yeah. buddies. Hey, which you can't again, give out all the No, I know, I know. I'm not going to say the script. I'm not going to say the script. But this is what I'm saying. There's so many practical like charts or scripts of like, hey... Honestly, I think I'm. I thought I was good at connecting pe- at, with people. Like I thought I had friendships, but it's really convicting to see. You how, do it, to see you the do. words. <laughs> define yeah, it. yeah. I don't know. You're a very intentional human. But check this out. Like, well, one, <clears throat> I think the other hard part about me being vulnerable is I like to think I'm an optimist. Like mm. I like to stay positive, and it's like, I'm hey, mm-hmm. what's what's going on in your life? Oh, it's all good. Like, no, yeah. you know, yeah. I always try to fast forward to that good season that I know is coming. Like, yep. oh, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not going to talk about the hard part because I know something good's coming. So let me just glaze over it. Mm. And that's me not being vulnerable. But then on top of that, mm-hmm. the difference between being vulnerable and venting, mm-hmm. it turns oh, it turns yeah, into like a, a sloppy one. mud, you know, like oh, if I was going to do that with the kids, it would probably not come out, hey, I just yelled at my kids. It would probably come out as my kids are being well i've been there too (laughs) there's a difference of like hey this is there this is me venting and it's pointing the finger at the outside Mm -hmm. people versus i just did oh that's good yeah Mm. which yeah which part are you sharing about how bad they are we're we're still practicing our way out of that that's good (laughs) especially with each other Mm -hmm. i feel like i vent less to my friends but i vent to him (laughs) and that is not good for our relationship he's like why are you doing this (laughs) wait that's what you know dads and husbands are here for take the pain we're punching bag (laughs) we'll make it (laughs) I feel like there's a thing, though, because you don't want to be around the, you know, the friend that just complains all the time, yeah. too. And it's like, I don't want to become that. So I want to be the guy. That, it's like, I, no, that's a great, I hadn't actually thought about that, but that is a great point. And I think, um, I, I think about this. I think my, my friends will call me out when they're like, sounds like you're complaining about Lauren. Mm-hmm. 
but actually mm. why did you respond that way to her <laughs> yeah and i they often i think lauren knows and loves this they often take her side mm -hmm. so like i'm sitting with matt and steve on the porch being like this is what a fight we had and they're like sounds like you messed up here and like, yeah yeah but did you hear what i said that she said <laughs> yeah. let's go back to it sounds like you messed up here <laughs> yeah Mm. I think good friends will help you move from venting to vulnerability, but that's it's that's a great distinction to make. Yeah, mm. I'm so excited for this book. So it's August 15th is release date. It's coming out less than a week now. It'll be mm. out. It'll be out. Oh, yeah, as, yeah. as, the as book people is are out. this, it's out. It's out. It, it is out. <laughs> Go get it. This thing is out. Uh, get all of them. Amazon, wherever. Amazon and it. wherever. It's so good. And thank you for the effort you put into writing this book. I um. I'm really excited. I'm challenged. So my big takeaway, one of them about vulnerability specifically, is to share specific stories. I think mm -hmm. actually Simon Sinek, as I was preparing for this interview, he's talking about how he made friends, which is so funny. That's like cool. we're adults, dude. And yeah. like friendship, I think what's challenging about this is we're all humans. We all think we know how to do friends friendships because mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's embedded in who we were made to be. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so it's like I don't need to be. I don't need to learn how to do that, but I think that's the whole point is like, we really kind of do. We need yeah. to relearn. Yeah. yeah. The encouragement, mm -hmm. you're made for people. That's why the book is called Made for People. Um, but the current of American life is taking you into isolation. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta practice, you gotta fight, you need other people to help. Well, and mm -hmm. even more so, I hate to like bring it back up, but like a pandemic isolated yes. the world yes. so much oh, and yes. took everything virtual that we rarely have the opportunity anymore to even form connections. Right. Because you're not in an office, you're not going places, you're not going to events. It's I think it's yeah. just shown that there's a massive issue. It's yeah. it's true. I mean, and you gotta fight for it. I mean it's good. The subtitle of this book is why we drift into loneliness and how to fight for a life of friendship. So we're all drifting. We're all in this together, but we gotta fight. Yeah. And it's made for people. It's not made for popularity or made for, you know, followers. Mm -hmm. It's like there you go. And there's something about you're not made covenant. for likes. Yeah. yeah, you're made for people. <laughs> a covenant friendship where it's like, hey, there will be really fun times together, but also really difficult times where we're not, where we're not, you know, loosey goosey bros. Like, there's gonna be some tough headbutting going on, so and that's the way it should be. So, mm -hmm. amen. Anyway, Justin. Oh shoot, my bad. Just throw it around. <laughs> my, my, I like it when my books my get bad. beat up. Don't yeah. get made yeah. to be thrown around. <laughs> Uh, thank we, you guys yeah. yeah thanks for having us really. this is a really fun conversation this has been awesome and thanks for everything y'all are doing out there Hi. game nights being vulnerable talking about your marriage y'all are the best so cool Trying. to be here I'm curious what's your best piece of marriage advice you've either been given or would give based mm. off experience I'm gonna make sure that is the last question no I wanna keep going babe I'm no, just you're not. loving it it's so I know good. mine but I'll wait <clears throat> it's yours you go first uh, practice praying together mm. It's we, just, we do a short 30 second prayer before we go to bed every night. It's so small, but it's so important. It just keeps us in the rhythm of actually talking to the Lord together, especially after you've had a fight or you're kind of mad, like okay, we still need to pray. I, th I think it's really changed. It's just given us like a, a continual current of knowing each other and talking to the Lord. Mm. Um. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good one. Yeah, because we talked about our goal was to pray together for like, the first eight years of our marriage, we're like, we should really pray together. Then we like, actually, we're like, let's actually just do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it took us a while. Um, I think I would say like every time you've been apart, you know, work every day, like when you come back together, like greet them, mm. acknowledge mm. them, smile at them. She's so good. At that. I love that. Yeah. Always comes to the door when I come home. Yeah. That Say was hi. his, that was his mom's advice to us when we were engaged. I love and that. I think that that's been really to, to be like, you are special to me even, mm in the midst of like whatever I'm doing. <laughs> we interviewed a couple uh, the Marshes and they talk about uh, this idea of hospitality and defining it as thinking of someone before they arrive and that mm. God was hospitable to us. So oh, you think about awesome. the story of like Abraham and him looking at the stars and you know, you could interpret it as like, hey, that star is Andrew in 2023 and that one's <laughs> yeah. Justin and you know, what, whatever. But like he was hospitable to us and then what does it mean to be hospitable to your spouse of like, I thought of you before you came. Like I greeted yeah. you at the door. That's or, awesome. Here's a, whatever, a glass of water. As you, and it's, mm -hmm. it's so easy to not do that. You know? Yeah. Um, anyway. All right. That's all we got. Wait, can I say? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> She's like, no. Uh, <laughs> no, no. It's the last thing. This is, is it. I'm going to close. 
In the book, he says a buddy that he was in a, a bridal party or a groomsman party with gave him a bottle of whiskey mm-hmm. with like 2035 written on it. Yeah. Got you a bottle of honey with 2028 written on it for when you write two more books together. We're going to have you come back on the show. <laughs> yes. Just it's, it's an investment in our future friendship. Right? This is awesome. All right. This is worth Love the one it. more thing. It was worth it. It was worth it. It. We'll be back. Anyway. Love it. All right. Thank you guys. <laughs>